Good day. This is Tammy Tolinar with Lele North America, and I'm having a coffee talk with John Potsma from Modesto, California. Good afternoon, John. How are things out on the farm? Good afternoon. Things are good. So tell us, with one of being one of the original um, automated barns in California, tell us a little bit about um, your barn and how you got started. Um, well, I'm third generation, so uh, my grandfather started back in 19, well, I guess started in the 50s, um, moved here from the Netherlands, um, but built his first dairy in the late 60s. Um, my dad uh, kind of took over, and uh, now it's my brother, my dad, and I. Um, we moved from a 14 stall California walkthrough flat barn into a 10 robot facility in 2017. And uh, currently we're milking 600 cows there along with uh, 1300 cows in a traditional barn still. Wow, that's a big change from a flat barn to uh, a robot barn. How did that work with the cows if you can remember? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's ingrained in my memory. <laughs> um, that's just a big transition. You know, you're going from the old, like really old fashioned way in a flat barn to completely automated. So it was just kind of neat to watch kind of everything unfold. Um, kind of neat to watch the cows learn how the system works on their own. And as well as, as us, they had a lot of learning to do too. So uh, all in all, it was a pretty exciting process. So now that you've been in your uh, robotic barn for a couple of years, what are some of the advantages that you see um, in your robotic barn compared to maybe your traditional barn? Um, well, I'm sure the big one that everybody kind of talks about is labor. Uh, you know, it's, you're still going to have labor because you're taking care of cows. So got to have eyes on the cows all the time still, but it definitely um, take some bodies out of the barn. Uh, just overall efficiency. I think every area, um, if, as long as you're doing things the right way, you're going to become more efficient. There's going to be some things that maybe are a little more expensive than you're used to. Um, some maintenance stuff and, and parts and stuff like that, but that's what you get when you, you go functional style to, to automation, things get a little more expensive on, on that side of things. Um, but everything from cow health, cow comfort, employee production, um, everything is just, is, uh, I think one level, if not two above. Yeah. I think if I saw your numbers from your traditional barn to when you went to your robot barn, you increased about 12 pounds per cow per day. So that's, a, that's a big, um, that's a big change. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a big change. And that, you know, that's just the, that's just the one that sticks out. There's a lot of little things in there that we don't look at every day. Um, you know, your coal rates, uh, how long your cows are going to last um, versus a traditional setting. So those, those, you know, there's a lot of financial benefits hidden, hidden in those, in those small things that we don't see every day, or that may not be on your dashboard on T4C. So, um, as we get further along, we, you know, we kind of pick up on more of those things too. Um, you, you can get caught up in just the production thing, but you gotta, you gotta look at the other areas as you decide whether or not you're going to grow or, or what your uh, future plans are going to be. Yeah. I know one thing that you mentioned at a time was um, hoof health and how your hoof health had improved with the moving to the robotic barn. Yeah, correct. Uh, so we don't do any foot baths in that barn currently. And um, it all boils down to time on concrete. Uh, you know, these cows are, they're milking really, really well. So from that point standpoint, they're, you know, they're still getting that, I guess you could call it a stress load, just the fact that they're, they're producing so much milk, but the time that they're on their feet, uh, we all know that the longer you're on your feet, the, the harder it is. So, um, you know, these cows get to decide when they're going to go get milk, when they're going to go eat and when they get to lay down and, and, uh, 
being able to do that, I think, is what influences uh, the hoof health so much. Now, I know you've had a lot of tours or in your neighborhood, probably a lot of your um, fellow dairyman friends ask you questions about robotics and how it's worked for you. What are some of the most popular things they ask or you make sure that you share with them? Well, I guess some of the things that have stood out to me from from uh, some other producers is, you know, they walk into the barn and they can't believe that there's cows being milked because it's just such a quiet environment. Um, and I think that speaks a lot for uh, what this system can do, not just for your cows, but for you too. Um, you know, it's kind of like being in New York City in a traditional setting <laughs> versus being in the middle of, you know, Montana in a robot barn. It's just quiet. You don't hear anything. There's nobody hollering. Um, so that's one thing that I think everybody really notices when they walk into the barn. Uh, some other questions are, you know, what do you do? How about, you know, if there's a cow that doesn't milk? Um, so, you know, it's, they have no idea. I've had several people walk into this barn and tell me that they had a whole different you know, mental picture of what a robotic facility was going to be like. So, um, you know, and then I explained to him how we have collect cow lists and we got a guy that's, you know, one thing, one of his major jobs is that he goes out and gets cows that haven't come to the robot in a certain amount of time or, or what have you, or, you know, check on and make sure they're not sick or that they aren't lame. Um, and then you always get the production question. Um, you know, what, what kind of increase have you seen in production and how many times a day are the cows milking? Um, you know, when the production question gets asked, uh, I think probably every dairyman has a different answer. Um, you know, it all kind of all depends on how you're feeding your cows and were you a three X herd before you started robots? Uh, you know, there's a lot of different, different, I think variables that play a part in that. So um, that's about all I can think of right now. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of differences in conventional dairies to robot dairies as well. So it's important to kind of remember that. But the right. other thing that they probably noticed in your barn is that the Juno, the automatic feed pusher. Oh yes. Yeah. That's probably the more famous thing inside the barn. I'd say, <laughs> uh, everybody loves the Juno. Um, matter of fact, guys that you know, aren't in the market for robots, see that and they definitely want to put that in their traditional barns, you know, in their traditional freestyle barns. So that's a, it's definitely a big hit. Um, we love it. Yeah. Because um, just to be clear in your robot barn, you don't have headlocks or anything like that. So it's a quiet free flow barn and the Juno is just doing its job, pushing up the feed to the, to the cows. Correct. Um, so that's a, a a quiet, um, calm environment for them. Yes. For sure. So what about when it comes to employee training or finding someone to work in the robot barn? Is that hard to do or um, does it involve a lot of training? Uh, you know, we thought at first it was going to be pretty challenging. We had a, the, our main guy in the barn. We had him picked out uh, plenty in advance. Uh, so we we really didn't prep him for anything, but he hung out when we were breaking cows in, you know, and kind of learned, learned as we learned. Uh, he picked up on it really quickly and is able to basically can tear a robot down from top to bottom and, and can do anything a uh, service tech from your local dealer would do. So that's been really a blessing for us. Um, and then we have a, a, a Hispanic guy that works at night as well. Um, and we thought he was going to be, you know, a little harder to train, but you know, it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a smartphone in a sense, everybody just gets used to him. So over time, you know, I'd say after a couple of weeks, they got it nailed down pretty good. It's I think more understanding the entire concept of milking in a robot facility. That's maybe harder for these guys to do. Um, the fact that we're not pushing cows, uh, you know, we're, we got to be quiet in the barn. We're, we're trying to get in the barn, get our work done and get out of the barn. They have a hard time wrapping their head around that. Cause that's just not what they have done for the last 10 or 15 years. So yeah. 
from that standpoint, it can be a little challenging, but once they see the results of, you know, we tell them to do some things and they look at us like we're kind of really crazy, you know, but once they see the results, then they, they get it. They understand it. One of the other um, uniquenesses uh, to a robot barn, but not for California, is that you do have the flush system still in the barn. Um, talk a little bit about that and how it's worked with the robots. And also, how often are you bedding in your barn? So um, the flush system, you know, typically most places in the valley, San Joaquin Valley, are going to be flush barns. Um, there's very few scrape barns here. Uh, that I know of. Um, so for us, the flush system, you know, it's just a, I, it, it's just a cleaner environment um, rather than scraping. So that was the big thing. Uh, you got both sides of the spectrum on that. You got the, the water board that hates flushing and the air board loves it. And, you know, the, and then it's vice versa on the scraping. So um <laughs> you're fighting some of those regulation things, but uh, in the long run, I think flush is always kind of the way to go. Uh, as long as you're not using all fresh water, you know, we, we can't, we do have to pay attention to our water usage. Um, I think as stewards of the land, that's what we're supposed to do anyhow. And so you do, you got to spend a little money, you know, in the infrastructure to create some decent water, recycled water that you can use in there. But, um, I, I do think it pays off the end. And then you had a second part to your question. I, so I think currently you're using compost bedding. Oh yeah, so, correct. So how do you work with updating and refreshing the bedding through that barn? So we, we groom beds every day, but we do, um, we do each pen every other day. So we'll do Currently, with the barn that we have, we'll do two pins on Monday, and then the other two pins on Tuesday, and then you know back and forth, back and forth, um, and then we we bed every every ten to twenty days, uh, depending on the conditions of the beds. Mm -hmm. And you um, just monitor that, yeah. Yeah, we just kind of monitor it. You know, um, you can always tell when the cows, you know, when the beds are getting a little too low. So the guys will say, hey, we got a bed today. And then when we bed, we typically don't groom anything just because it adds another job to the, you know, to the mm -hmm. schedule and creates a little more of a longer day for these guys. So we just bed and we'll run a rake over the top of the beds immediately after we're done bedding and, and that's it and get back out of the barn. And probably with how you describe, the cows are pretty calm in that barn, even through that kind of routine activity as well. Yeah, cows are still, you know, they're creatures of habit. So they know when we're going in there with a rake tractor, or we're going in there with a freestall truck, they know what's going to happen. So they, they get up and start moving for us. So looking to automation in the future, where do you see um, automated milking system, uh, feed pushing for at your farm and for others? Well, I think in California right now, uh, considering what everybody's been going through and the state of the industry, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more popular, I think. Um, I, I hear more about it. So I think, uh, you know, in our area, it's going to be something I think is just going to gain steam here in the next couple of years, some pretty big steam. In our circumstance, our plan is to go completely automated at some point in time. Uh, that's, you know, time will tell how quick we'll be able to do that. But uh, we're currently uh, working on Born 2 right now as far as some planning and design stuff. You know, we're changing a few things and uh, just getting ready to kind of enter the permitting process. So uh, hopefully by this time next year, maybe we'll have Born 2 ready. And awesome. um yeah, then, you know, uh, Laylee's counting me about putting a vector in, so I'm sure that's around the corner, too. Yeah, well, the vector offers some uniquenesses in automated feeding, which would be um, another less vehicle in the barn, right? Correct. Yeah, correct. And, and I, think, I think it's good. I, 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 love, the, I love the whole uh, theory 
that Lele has as far as kind of being a universal, taking a universal approach kind of in-house on everything um, all the way to the, the orbiter that can, you know, generate your own product. They you can slap your own brand on someday. Uh, that's kind of always been a dream of mine is to be able to label something on our own and sell it on our own. So maybe that's in the future too. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Well, John, I hope that I get to visit your dairy again soon and to see this barn number two. Um, I thank you for spending time today here with our Lele Coffee Talk. And for those that are watching, they can um, subscribe to watch this Lele Coffee Talk and the next ones to come. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tammy.